welcome to this inaugural reading of the foundational documents of American democracy. My name is Chuck Anderson, and I, along with Judge Steve Shannon, Steve, take a bow, please, um, co-chair the edu Educational Events Committee of the Liberty Amendments Month effort. Um, at the outset, I'd like to thank our co-hosts for this event. They are the Town of Vienna, thank you, Town, uh, Historic Vienna, Inc., stand up when your group is uh, mentioned, take a bow. Thank you, Historic Vienna. American Legion Post 180. Yay. Church of the Holy Comforter. All right, it's getting competitive in here. All right, the Emanuel Lutheran Church. Emanuel Lutheran and a solid block. Emmaus Church of Christ. Thank you, Emmaus. Why did I say Emmaus? I'm, I'm correcting that for next year. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk about those later. And, and um, last but not least, the Vienna Business Association, who has also provided us with refreshments uh, for today. So thank, thanks to all of these groups for this pioneer effort. Um, today, I'd also like to acknowledge Mayor Linda Colbert, who um, has graced us today. Um, I don't see any other council members or dignitaries, um, so let's just move on. I also want to thank the Parks and Recreation staff for helping us put on all LAM events, including this one. And I'm especially grateful to Denise and Tia, who, uh, among others, opened the community center up today. It was normally it's closed. So they're, they have come on their day off to be with us to, to make this happen. So thank you very much. And I also have to thank my good friend Frank and Rob, my good friends Frank and Robin Saylor, because I stole these buntings from their, um, from their porch this morning. They're on vacation, and I told them I would return them in time for next year's Fourth of July celebration. As far as I know, this is the first time we've done this in Vienna. Um, I found out about this last year um, in Falls Church, where their Village and Preservation Society make this an annual event. Um, I found it so moving uh, that I've borrowed the idea, so to speak. And I think it fits perfectly into our Liberty Amendments Month mission, which is to celebrate the political ideals that unite us. So why do we do this? I think it's imp more important to publicly celebrate our foundational heritage. Events in the recent past has shown us the fragility of our great American experiment in self-government. The readings of these documents allows us to remember, yes, and to in some extent even relive this important truth, that our nation's government grew from extremely rich agar dish of philosophical ideas, principles, and laws, and not from blood relationships or the brute force of strong men or from factional wars. These really radical notions of liberty, equality, and the rule of law are America's gift to the rest of the world. They may not have been perfect, but with them therein are the idealistic seeds that have grown into a more perfect union. Before we start, let me give you the ground rules, okay? This is gonna be a round robin reading, so all of you can participate if you want, okay? We'll be using a mic because we're videotaping the event. I think the video will be posted in about a week. Jeff has the mic right now, so show them the mic. That's the mic. <laughs> so for each document, I'm going to do a brief introduction trying to put the, the document into context. And then I'll ask the person holding the mic to start from the top of the text. You're going to read in blocks. You'll notice that your booklet has the documents printed in blocks. What is a block? Well, you can kind of decide. Sometimes they're obvious, sometimes they're not. But basically, it's about a paragraph um, or two or three sentences. When you think you've read a block, just pass the mic on to the next person. It doesn't matter where you really um, uh, leave off, but it does matter where you start. Just start where the last person left off. <laughs> By the way, when you look at the um, readings, uh, you'll notice that the spelling and the punctuation and the capitalization is kind of weird. That's not because we just basically 
did this last night at, at, at 2 in the morning. Um, we have tried as much as possible to keep the original text as is to give you a feel for the historical documents. In the 18th century, and most of these um, you, you know, documents, especially in the beginning, date from then, there were no standard rules for punctuation, spelling, or capitalization. And oftentimes, in letters of those days, you'll see the same word spelled three times in one document, and that was perfectly fine back then. If you don't want to read, recite out loud, just simply pass the mic to the next person. And if the last person in the last row, whoever that might be, could bring the mic back to Jeff, then we will begin again. One final introductory thought. It's entirely fitting that the people read these documents out loud. After all, the whole premise of the American ex political experiment, that the re responsibility and the running of government lies with the people, all of us, just not kings or warlords. These are our documents that lay the foundation of our government. We're gonna start with the Fairfax Resolves. These were drafted just down the road in Alexandria. I first read them over 40 years ago when I was doing research for my senior college thesis. The Fairfax Resolves were issued in July 1774 following a series of events including the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, the Stamp Act, and a group of acts that were called the Intolerable Acts. Listen carefully and you will hear reference to these events. While the resolves are attributed jointly to George Mason and George Washington, most scholars believe that Mason was the principal author. The Fairfax resolves would morph into the Continental Association and the document would re be read up and down the Atlantic seaboard and start the process of crystallizing the case for independence. The Fairfax resol resolves also represents the first public instance where Mason and Washington adopted anti-slavery language, slavery being an institution they both were intimately familiar with, by the way, to describe the abuses that the British subjects felt they were being suffered by the imperial government. That contradiction, which jumps right out of the text of the modern reader, did not go unnoticed at the time. The always quotable Samuel Johnson said, why do we hear the loudest yelps of liberty from the drivers of Negroes. In toto, the actions of the imperial government in London stripped British colonials of what they deemed to be fundamental rights, including the right to be trialed lo locally and to self-governments. A couple of other highlights in this document, though you will see the colonialists still considered themselves to be British citizens, they did not want to be slaves to the empire. This document holds very clearly that taxation and representation are inalienable and interlinked rights. And finally, this is one of the first instances that basically condemns the process of trading in human chattel, it deemed a wicked, cruel, and unnatural, and should be banned. And with that, Jeff, begin, please. The Fairfax County Resolves. At a meeting of the freeholders and inhabitants of the county of Fairfax on Monday, the 18th day of July, 1774, at the courthouse, George Washington Esquire, chairman, and Robert Harrison, gentleman, clerk of the said meeting. One. <clears throat> Resolved that this colony and dominion of Virginia cannot be considered as a conquered country and if it was that the present inhabitants are the descendants not of the conquered but of the conquerors that the same was not settled at the national expense of england but at the private expense of the adventurers our ancestors by solemn compact with and under the auspices and protection of the british crown upon which we are in every respect as dependent as the people of great britain and in the same manner subject to all his majesty's just, legal, and constitutional prerogatives. That our ancestors, when they 
left their native land and settled in America brought with them, even if the same had not been confirmed by charters, the civil constitution and form of government of the country they came from, and whereby the laws of nature and nations <coughs> entitled to all its privileges, immunities, and advantages, which have descended to us their posterity and ought of right to be as fully enjoyed as if we had still continued within the realm of England, resolved that the most important and valuable part of the British Constitution upon which its very existence depends is the fundamental principle of the peoples being governed by no laws to which they have not given their consent by representatives freely chosen by themselves who are affected by the laws they enact equally with their con consti constituents whom they are accountable and whose burdens they share in which consists the safety and happiness of the community. For if this part of the Constitution was taken away or materially altered, the government must degenerate either into an absolute and despotic monarchy or a tyrannical aristocracy and the freedom of the people be annihilated. Three, resolve therefore as the inhabitants of the American colonies are not and from their situation cannot be represented in the British Parliament, that the legislative power here can of right be exercised only by our own provincial assemblies or parliaments, subject to the assent or negative of the British Crown, to be declared within some proper limited time. But as it was thought just and reasonable that the people of Great Britain should reap advantages from these colonies adequate to the protection they afforded them, the British Parliament have claimed and exercised the power of regulating our trade and commerce so as to restrain our importing from foreign countries such articles as they could furnish us with of their own growth or manufacture or exporting to foreign countries such articles and portions of our produce as Great Britain stood in need of for her own consumption or manufactures. Such a power, directed with wisdom and moderation, seems necessary for the general good of that great body politic of which we are a part, although in some degree repugnant to the principles of the Constitution. Under this idea, our ancestors submitted to it the experience of more than a century during the government of His Majesty's royal pre predecessors hath proved its utility and the reciprocal benefits following from it produced mutual uninterrupted harmony and goodwill between the inhabitants of Great Britain and her colonies, who during that period always considered themselves as one and the same people. And though such a power is capable of abuse and in some instances hath been stretched beyond the original design and institution, Yet to avoid strife and contention with our fellow subjects and strongly impressed with the experience of mutual benefits, we always cheerfully acquiesced in it while the entire regulation of our internal policy and giving, our, and, giving and granting our own money were preserved to our own provincial legislatures. Four, resolved that it is the duty of these colonies on all emergencies to contribute in proportion to their abilities, situation, and circumstances to the necessary charge of supporting and defending the British Empire, of which they are part, that while we are treated upon an equal footing with our fellow subjects, the motives of self-interest and preservation will be a sufficient obligation, as was evident through the course of the last war, and that no argument can, can be fairly applied to the British Parliament's taxing us upon a presumption that we should refuse a just and reasonable con contribution, but will equally operate in justification of the executive power taxing the people of England 
upon a supposition of their representatives refusing to grant the necessary supplies. Five, resolved that the claim lately assumed and exercised by the British Parliament of making all such laws as they think fit to govern the people of these colonies and to extort from us our money without our consent is not only diametrically contrary to the first principles of the Constitution and the original compacts by which we are dependent upon the British Crown and government, but it is totally incompatible with the privileges of a free people and the natural rights of mankind will render our own legislators, legislatures merely nominal and nugatory and is calculated to reduce us from a state of freedom and happiness to slavery and misery. Six, resolved that taxation and representation are in their nature inseparable, that the right of withholding or of giving and granting their own money is the only effectual security to a free people against the encroachments of despotism and tyranny, and that whenever they yield the one, they must quickly fall a prey to the other. Resolved that the powers over the people of America now claimed by the British House of Commons, in whose election we have no share, on whose determinations we can have no influence, whose information must be always defective and often false, who in many instances may have a separate and in some an opposite interest to ours, and who are removed from those impressions of tenderness and compassion arising from personal intercourse and connections, which soften the rigors of the most despotic governments, must, if continued, establish the most grievous and intolerable species of tyranny and oppression that ever was inflicted upon mankind. Eight, resolved that it is our greatest wish and inclination as well as interest to continue our connection with and dependence upon the British government. But though we are its subjects, we will use every means which he heaven hath given us to prevent our becoming its slaves. Nine, resolve that there is a premeditated design and system formed and pursued by the British ministry to introduce an arbitrary government into His Majesty's American dominions, to which end they are artfully prejudiced, prejudicing our sovereign and inflaming the minds of our fellow subjects in Great Britain by propagating the most malevolent falsehoods, particularly that there is an intention in the American colonies to set up for independent states. Endeavoring at the same time by various acts of violence and oppression, by sudden and repeated dissolutions of our assemblies, whenever they presume to examine the illegality of ministerial mandates or deliberate on the violated rights of their constituents, and by breaking in upon the American charters to reduce us to a state of desperation and dissolve the original compacts by which our ancestors bound themselves and their posterity to remain dependent upon the British crown, which measures, unless effectually counteracted, will end in the ruin both of Great Britain and her colonies. Resolved that the several acts of Parliament for raising a revenue upon the people of America without their consent, the creating new and dangerous jurisdictions here, the taking away our trials by jury, by the ordering persons upon criminal accusations to be tried in another country than that in which the fact is charged to have been committed. The act inflicting ministerial vengeance upon the town of Boston and the two bills lately brought into Parliament for abrogating, abrogating the charter of the province of Massachusetts Bay and for the protection and encouragement of murderers in the said province are part of the above mentioned inquitious system. That the inhabitants of the town of Boston are now suffering in the common cause of all British America and are justly entitled to its support and assistance, and therefore that a subscription ought to be immediately to be opened and proper persons appointed in every county of this colony to purchase provisions and consign them to some gentleman of character in Boston to be distributed among the poor sort of people here. 11. 
resolved that we will cordially join with our friends and brethren of this and the other colonies in such measures as shall be judged most effective for procuring redress of our grievances, and that upon obtaining such redress, if the destruction of T, gloomy prospects before us, oops, I think I skipped my page. The T, the Boston, will be regarded as an invasion of private property. We shall be willing to contribute towards paying the East India Company the value. But as we consider the said company as the tools and instruments of oppression in the hands of government and the cause of our present distress, it is the opinion of this meeting that the people of these colonies should forbear all further dealings with them by refusing to purchase their merchandise until that peace, safety, and good order which they have disturbed will be perfectly restored. And that all tea now in this colony or which, uh, or which shall be imported into its ship before the first day of September next should be deposited in some storehouse to be appointed by the respective committee, committees of each county until a sufficient sum of money be raised by subscription to reimburse the owners the value and then to be publicly burned and destroyed. And if the same is not paid for and destroyed as aforesaid, then it, that it remain in the custody of, of the said committees at the risk of the owners until the act of parliament imposing a duty upon T for raising a revenue in America be repealed and immediately afterward be delivered unto the several properties, properties therefore their agents or attorneys. 12, resolved that nothing will so much contribute to defeat the pernicious designs of the common enemies of Great Britain and her colonies as a firm union of the latter who ought to regard every act of violence or oppression inflicted upon any one of them as aimed at all, and to effect this desirable purpose that a Congress should be appointed to consist of deputies from all the colonies to concert a general and uniform plan for the defense and preservation of our common rights and continuing the connection and dependence of the said colonies upon Great Britain under a just, lenient, penitent, and constitutional form of government. 13. Resolved that our most sincere and cordial thanks be given to the patrons and friends of liberty in Great Britain for their spirited and patriotic conduct in support of our constitutional rights and privileges and their generous efforts to prevent the present distress and calamity of America. 14. Resolved that every little jarring interest and dispute which has ever happened between these colonies should be buried in eternal oblivion, and that all manner of luxury and extravagance ought immediately to be laid aside as totally inconsistent with the threatening and gloomy prospect before us that it is the indispensable duty of these gentlemen and men of fortune to set examples of temperance, fortitude, frugality, and industry, and give every encouragement in their power, particularly by subscriptions and premiums to the improvement of arts and manufactures in America. <laughs> and attention should be had to the cultivation of flax, cotton, and other materials for manufactures, and we recommend it such of the inhabitants who have large stocks of sheep to sell their neighbors at a moderate price as the most certain means of speedily increasing our breed of sheep and quantity of wool. 15. Resolved that until American grievances be redressed by restoration of our just rights and privileges, no goods or merchandise whatsoever ought to be imported into this colony which shall be shipped from Great Britain or Ireland after the first day of September next, except linens not exceeding 15 pence per yard, coarse woolen cloth not exceed exceeding two shillings sterling per yard, nails wire and wire cards, needles and pins, paper, salt, petra, and medicines, which three articles only may be imported until the first day of September 1776. 
And if any goods or merchandise other than those hereby accepted should be shipped from Great Britain or Ireland after the time aforesaid to this colony, that the same immediately upon their arrival should either be sent back again by the owners, their agents or attorneys, or stored and deposited in some warehouse to be appointed by the committee for each respective county, and there kept at the risk and charge of the owners, to be delivered to them when a free importation of goods hither shall again take place. And that the merchants and the vendors of goods and merchandise within this colony ought not to take advantage of our present distress, but continue to sell the goods and merchandise which they now have, or which may be shipped to them before the first day of September next, at the same rates and prices that they have been accustomed to do within one year last past. And if any person shall sell such goods on any other terms than above expressed, that no inhabitant of this colony should at any time for thereafter deal with him, his agent, factor, or storekeepers for any commodity whatsoever. 16. Resolved that it is the opinion of this meeting that the merchants and vendors of goods and merchandise within this colony should take an oath not to sell or dispose of any goods or merchandise whatsoever which may be shipped from Great Britain or Ireland after the first day of September next, as aforesaid, except the three articles before accepted, and they, that they will, upon receipt of such prohibited goods, either send the same back again by the first opportunity, or deliver them to the committees in the respective counties to be deposited in some warehouse at the risk and charge of the owners, until they, their agents or factors, be permitted to take them away by the said committees. The names of those who refuse to take such oaths to be advertised by the respective committees in the counties wherein they reside, and to the end that the inhabitants of this colony may know what merchants and vendors of goods and merchandise have taken such oath that the respective committees should grant a certificate thereof to every such person who shall take the same. 17. Resolved that it is the opinion of this meeting that during our present difficulties and distress, no slaves ought to be imported into any of the British colonies on this continent, and we take this opportunity of declaring our most earnest wishes to see an entire stop forever put to such a wicked, cruel, and unnatural trade. 18. Resolved that no kind of lumber should be imported, exported from this colony to the West Indies until America be restored to her constitutional rights and liberties if the other colonies will accede to a like resolution and that it be recommended to the General Congress to appoint as early a day as possible for the stopping such export. 19. Resolved that it is the opinion of this meeting, if American grievances be not redressed before the first day of November, 1,775, that all exports of produce from the several colonies to Great Britain or Ireland should cease, and to carry the said resolution more effectually into execution, that we will not plant or cultivate any tobacco after the crop now growing, provided the same measure shall be adopted by the other colonies on this continent, as well as those who have heretofore made tobacco, as those who have not. And it is our opinion also, if the Congress of Deputies from the several colonies shall adopt the measure of non-exportation to Great Britain, as the people will thereby d disabled from paying their debts, that no judgments should be rendered by the courts in the said colonies for any debt after information of the said measures being determined upon. 20. Resolved that this is the opinion of this meeting that a solemn covenant and association should be entered into by the inhabitants of all the colonies upon oath, that they will not, after the times which shall be respectively agreed on and at the General Congress, export any manner of lumber to the West Indies, nor any of their produce to Great Britain or Ireland, 
or sell or dispose of the same to any person who shall not have entered into the said covenant and association. And also that they will not import or receive any goods or merchandise which shall be shipped from Great Britain or Ireland after the first day of September next, other than the before enumerated articles, nor buy or purchase any goods except as before accepted of any person whatsoever who shall not have taken the oath herein before recommended to be taken by the merchants and vendors of goods, nor buy or purchase any slaves hereafter imported into any part of this continent until a free exportation and importation be again resolved by a majority of the representatives or deputies of the colonies. And that the respective committees of the counties in each colony so soon as a covenant and association becomes general, published by advertisements in their several counties and gazettes of their colonies, a list of the names of those, if any such there be, who will not accede therefore to, that such traitors to their country may be publicly known and detested. 21 resolved. That is in the opinion of this meeting that this and the other associated colonies should break off all trade, intercourse, and dealings with that colony, providence, or town which shall decline or refuse to agree to the plan which shall be adopted by the General Congress. 22. Resolved that should the town of Boston be forced to submit to the late cruel and oppressive measures of government, that we shall not hold the same to be binding upon us, but will, notwithstanding, religiously maintain and inviolably adhere to such measures as shall be concerted by the General Congress for the preservation of our lives, liberties, and fortunes. 23. Resolved that it be recommended to the deputies of the General Congress to draw up and transmit a humble and dutiful petition and remonstrance to His Majesty asserting with decent firmness or just and constitutional rights and privileges, lamenting the fatal necessity of being compelled to enter into measures disgusting to his majesty and his parliament, or injurious to our fellow subjects in Great Britain, declaring in the strongest terms our duty and affection to his majesty's person, family, and government, and our desire to continue our dependence upon Great Britain, and most humbly conjuring and beseeching his majesty not to reduce his faithful subjects of America to a state of desperation, and to reflect that from our sovereign, there can be but one appeal. And it is the opinion of this meeting that after such petition and remonstrance shall have been presented to his majesty, the same should be printed in the public papers in all the principal towns in Great Britain. 24. Resolved that George Washington Esquire and George Broadwater, gentlemen, lately elected our representatives <coughs> to serve in the General Assembly be appointed to attend the convention at Williamsburg on the first day of August next, and present these resolves as the sense of the people of this county upon the measures proper to be taken in the present alarming and dangerous situation of America. Well done. I think we got it down, don't we? The next. I have to do a little introduction, is the Virginia Declaration of Rights. This was adopted in June 1776 by the Virginia Convention that had formed to assemble a new state or commonwealth government. George Mason is the primary drafter of this document, which contains 16 statements. How important were these to the people of Virginia? Well, interestingly, the Bill of Rights, or the Declaration of Rights in Virginia, preceded the state constitution, unlike our federal government, where the constitution came first, and the, uh, the Bill of Rights were the first 10 amendments. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. The notion of a standalone legal document that trumps the power of any and all once and future political powers is a revolutionary concept. 
one which was born at Gunston Hall, just a few miles away from here. Listen as these words are read, for you will hear in later documents, for words you will hear in later documents, including the soon to be adopted Declaration of Independence, and of course, the Bill of Rights. Cassandra, let's go. Adopted 12 June 1776. A Declaration of Rights made by the representatives of the good people of Virginia, assembled in full and free convention, which rights do pertain to them and their posterity as the basis and foundation of government? One, that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or de divest their posterity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. That all power is vested in and consequently derived from the people that magistrates are their trustees and servants and at all times amenable to them. That government is or ought to be instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, nation, or community of all the various modes and forms of government that at best which is capable of producing the greatest degree happiness and safety and is most effectually security against the danger of maladministration. And that whenever any government shall be found inadequate or contrary to these purposes, a majority of the community hath an indubitable, unalienable, and indefeasible right to reform, alter, or abolish it in such manner as shall be judged most conducive to the public weal. Four, that no many or set of men are entitled to exclusive or separate emoluments and privileges from the community, but in consideration of public services, which not being descendable, neither ought the offices of magistrate, legislator, or judge to be hereditary. Five, that the legislative and executive powers of the state should be separate and distinct from the judicative, ju and that the members of the two first may be restrained from op oppression by feeling and participating the burdens of the people. They should, at fixed periods, be reduced to a private station, return into that body from which they were originally taken and the vacancies be supplied by frequent, certain, and regular elections, in which all or any part of the former members to be again eligible or ineligible as the law shall direct. Six, that elections of members to serve as representatives of the people in assembly ought to be free, and that all men having sufficient evidence of permanent common interest with and attachments to the community have the right of suffrage and cannot be taxed or deprived of their property for public uses without their own consent or that of their representatives so elected, nor bound by any law to which they have not in like manner assented for the public good. Seven that all power of suspending laws or the execution of laws by any authority without consent of the representatives of the people is injurious to their rights and ought not to be exercised. Eight, that in all capital or criminal prosecutions, a man hath the right to demand the cause and nature of his accusation to be confronted with the accusers and witnesses, to call for evidence in his favor, and to a speedy trial by an impartial jury of his vicinage, without whose unanimous consent he cannot be found guilty, nor can he be compelled to give evidence against himself 
that no man be deprived of his liberty except by the law of the land or the judgment of his peers. Number nine, that excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines be imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. 10, that general warrants whereby any officer or messenger may be commanded to search suspected places without evidence of a fact committed or to seize any person or persons not named or whose offense is not particularly described and supported by evidence are grievous and oppressive and ought not be granted. 11. That in controversies respecting property and in suits between man and man, the ancient trial by jury is preferable to any other and ought to be held sacred. 12. That the freedom of the press is one of the greatest bulwarks of liberty and can never be restrained but by despotic governments. 13. That a well-regulated militia, post body of the people, <clears throat> trained to arms is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state. That standing armies in time of peace should be avoided as dangerous to liberty. And that, in all cases, the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the silver, civil power. 14. That the people have a right to uniform government and therefore that no government separate from or independent of the government of Virginia ought to be erected or established within the limits thereof. 15. That no government or the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people but by a firm adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, and virtue, and by frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. 16. That religion, or the duty which we owe to our Creator, and the manner of discharging it, can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. And therefore, all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion, according to the dictates of conscience, that it is the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity towards each other. And there you have it, the Virginia Declaration of, of Rights, sort of a mashup in our ears between the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. And now we turn to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, to understand its significance, I think it's important to start with what the Declaration is not. Even though it's understood by us today to be the formal dissolution of America's ties with Britain, this is not a treaty. It's not even clear if the signatories were acting for, as they had been elected by probably illegal, um, uh, different governments, many of which had been formed um, outside the normal process or were representatives of ad hoc committees. But as you'll hear, events from 17 to 74 to 76 forced the issue for many. By June of 1776, there was enough support in Congress to form a committee of five, consisting of John Adams from Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin from Pennsylvania, Roger Sherman from Connecticut, Robert Livingston from New York, and a young Thomas Jefferson from Virginia. Now Adams, as many of you know, and his fellow Massachusetts delegates were the strongest proponents for separation. And Adams was a very proud man, but he was also a very shrewd man. And he also knew rhetorical genius when he heard it. So it was Adams who actually urged and pushed Jefferson to be the prime drafter of the Declaration of Independence. The rest, as they say, is history. A resolution of independence passed unanimously in Philadelphia on July 2nd, 1776, and the text we will be reading from was ratified two days later. So what is the Declaration of Independence? As, it, as you read it, you will see that it can be broken into three distinctive parts. The first part, which is the one most cited, 
sets out the basic tenets of democratic government and picks up on a lot of those ideas that you just heard in the Virginia Declaration of Rights. The second part, which is the part you all will be reading, is basically an indictment and justification for dissolving the union between Britain and America. And finally, the third part is a conclusion which declares America's independence from Great Britain. Now, for the reading of this document, we're going to mix it up again, up, up a bit. We have with us today Jeff Allen, who's a local Viennese and a renowned actor of stage, television, and movies. Jeff will be reading the introduction or the preamble and conclusion sections of the Declaration of Independence from here. And while the rest of you, you will chime in when we get to the train of abuses, doing it the same way that we've done in the past. So in order of events, it'll be Jeff first, you next, Jeff end, uh, will be ending. And the breaks you can see in the document where the asterisks are printed across, but I'll also try to give some, uh, just some uh, indication. So without further ado, Jeff. <laughs> when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to this separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and, accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But, when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain, George III, is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world.
He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained, and when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with many firmness his invasions on the right of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws or for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out of their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of the superior of the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to other acts of pretended legislation. For protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. For transporting us beyond, ocean, beyond seas to be tried for pretending offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments. for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He has at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, and he has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare 
is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice. and consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. We now turn to the Bill of Rights. <laughs> Following the Revolutionary War, our nation struggled to form a lasting national government. The Constitutional Convention of 1787 was seen as a final last-ditch effort to make a working federal democracy. The convention drew many of our nation's political literati, including Washington, Madison, Mason, and Franklin to Philadelphia where they worked throughout that summer behind blacked out curtains and surrounded by roads that had been covered with sawdust so as to tamp down the noise and let the creative juices flow. A number of compromises on things small and large, such as big versus little states, slavery and commerce, allowed the work to continue. But on the final days of that convention, even though he had supported the work and had been actively involved in its formation, Mason suddenly rose up to oppose the draft constitution. His first objection was that the constitution lacked a bill of rights. 
it was kind of strange for Mason to wait so long because, as we mentioned earlier, the Declaration of Rights in Virginia had actually preceded the state constitution. The timing and real intent of Mason's objections are one of those historical mysteries that probably won't ever be resolved. But whatever his motivation, Mason's objections, including a lack of a Bill of Rights, became the rallying cry for those who opposed the new Constitution in the state ratification conventions held over the next two and a half years. The new Constitution would only come into effect upon ratification of nine out of the 13 states. But many supporters believe that wasn't enough, that the key states, the big states, that is New York, Virginia, and Massachusetts, would have to be among those who signed on. And at the Massachusetts ratification convention, a deal was struck. A few opponents agreed to switch their votes from no to yes, thus ensuring passage in exchange for a promise that the first act of the new Congress would to be the passage of the Bill of Rights. And the promise was kept. On October 2nd, 1789, not long after President Washington was inaugurated as our first president, he sent copies of the 12 amendments adopted by Congress to those states. By December 15th, 1791, that's pretty fast when you think about it, three-fourths of the states had ratified 10 of these, which are now known as the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights, Article 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Article two, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Article three, no soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Article 4. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be val violated and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Article five, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime, unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Article six, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Article seven, in suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury 
shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. Article 8. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Article 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Article 10. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the United States respectively or to the people. Now on to the Emancipation Proclamation. With the recent establishment of Juneteenth as an, an official federal holiday, there's been renewed interest in a statement released by President Lincoln three years earlier, the Emancipation Proclamation. Neither the Emancipation Proclamation nor the proclamation in Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865, entirely eliminated slavery. That would come with the 13th Amendment, which we will read in a few minutes. But this document deserves its place in today's reading. It's unique in that it is not democratically adopted. It's an executive order from a wartime president and applies only to states in rebellion. But it is a hallmark statement of our American nation as it laid out the case for righting one of the nation's gravest wrongs. By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation, whereas on the 22nd day of September in the year of our Lord, 1862, a proclamation was issued by the President of the United States containing among other things, the following to wit. That on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then henceforward and forever free and the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they make, may make for their actual freedom. That the executive will on the first day of January aforesaid by proclamation designate the states and parts of states, if any, in which the people thereof respectively shall then be in rebellion against the United States, and the fact that any state or people thereof shall on that day be in good faith represented in the Congress of the United States by members chosen thereto at elections wherein a majority of the qualified voters of this state shall have participated, shall, in the absence of strong countervailing testimony, be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people thereof are not then in rebellion against the United States. Now therefore, I can't resist. Now therefore, <laughs> I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, by virtue and power invested in me as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, do on this first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863, and in accordance with my purpose to do so publicly proclaimed for the full period of 100 days from the day first above mentioned, order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof respectively are this day in rebellion against the United States, the following to wit. Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, except the parishes of St. Bernard, Plaque Mines, Jefferson, St. John, St. Charles, St. James Ascension, Assumption, Terrebonne, Lafourche, St. Mary, St. Martin, and Orleans, including the city of New Orleans, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, 
South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, except the 48 counties designated as West Virginia, and also the counties of Berkeley, Accomack, Northampton, Elizabeth City, York, Princess Anne, and Norfolk, including the cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth, and which accepted parts are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. And by virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward shall be free and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declare to be free to abstain from all violence and less in necessary self-defense, and I recommend to them that in all cases, when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act sincerely believed to be an act of justice warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington this first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 87th. Thank you. And now the Liberty Amendments. These next four amendments are near and dear to us in Vienna. Uh, Liberty Amendments Month, if you haven't heard by now, was the brainchild of our town manager, Mercury Payton, as a response to the deep divisions in our country that had emerged the year before with the murder of George Floyd and the BLM response. Mercury wanted a response that would emphasize our shared values and not our divisions. Thus was born the idea of celebrating those four amendments, an idea we in Vienna can be rightly proud of. Hopefully in coming years, it will spread throughout Virginia and the rest of the country. Taken together, these amendments move America closer to the, our natural law ideals, which you've already heard this morning, laid out in earlier documents, that all people are created equal and enjoy certain inalienable rights. They can also be viewed as an important point in the arc that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of, that is the moral arc of the universe that bends towards justice. The first three amendments, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th, collectively are often referred to as the Reconstruction Amendments and were passed in relatively quick succession in the years following the Civil War. Their purpose was to give African Americans protections and liberties that would grant them full access into American polity. That, of course, did not happen, and there would be many years of struggle to help achieve those goals and the struggle still goes on. But there one amendment in particular, the 14th, turned out to be seminal in the nation's march to extend rights and liberties. The due process and equal protection clauses in that amendment have been, been applied to many different issues. And of course, the extent and meaning of, the, of those um, clauses are still being debated today. The final amendment, the 19th, righted a wrong suffered by at least half of American people at any time before passage. In 1920, women finally won their right to vote. Their battle for equality, of course, is not yet over. But the 19th was an extremely important step in that path, the Liberty Amendments. Amendment 13, Section 1. 
neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Passed by the Congress, January 31, 1865, ratified December 6, 1865. Amendment 14. Passed on Congress, June 13, 1866. Section 1. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Section two, representatives shall be appointed among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed, but then the right to vote at any election for the choice of the electors for president and vice president of the United States, representatives in Congress, the executive and judicial officers of a state, or the members of the legislation their legislature thereof is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States, or in any way abridged except for the participation in rebellion or other crime be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall be on mayor whole to the number of male citizens 21 years of age in such state. Section three, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of the president and vice president or hold any office civil, excuse me, or military under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may vote may by vote of two-thirds of each house remove such disability. Section 4. The validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion, shall not be questioned. But neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States or any claim for the loss or emancipation of any slave. But all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. Section 5. The Congress shall have the power to enforce, by appropriate legislation, the provisions of this article. Amendment 15. Passed by Congress, February 26, 1869. Ratified February 3, 1870. Section 1. The rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section 2. The Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Amendment 19. Passed by Congress June 4, 1919. Ratified August 18, 1920. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation.
We made it. <laughs> Just one final thing. It's a Pledge of Allegiance. It's the last document in your book, and we're going to recite it together. That pledge was originally drafted in 1882, and it was recited by school children in 1892 at the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's voyage. The wording was changed slightly in 1923, and it was recognized by Congress in 1942 as our official pledge. And the final change was not that long ago in 1954 when the words under God were added. Please stand and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Go ahead, have a seat. I just want to thank everybody for coming today and for reading. Uh, I leave you with this parting thought. We remain a country of free individuals. That is a republic only, to paraphrase, Benjamin Franklin, if we can keep it. Public readings like these help us to cement these ideas within our society, and I'm sure our founders would agree. Thank you.